God told man to be holy. That's it. That's it. Holiness has no date. No date. No Holiness date. have no founder. Yeah. Holiness have no beginning. That's right. Holiness have no ending. That's right. Holiness was here before the written Bible was here. That's right. Notice what I said. Holiness was here before the written scriptures was here. Written. That's right. Before there was any written book that took on the word Bible or religious book of yeah. any, kind, any kind, holiness was already here. Already That's here. Right. That's right. For who can be holy other than God? That's right. Holiness is the characteristics of God. God. Notice Ephesians 1 4. According as he has chosen us, according in him. as he, as he, God, is one. That's right. Has chosen us. So in that means according to as he, he. according to as God has, has chosen us. In him. In him. Before. What? Before. The foundation of the world. Anytime you say before the foundation of the world, that means before the existence of creation. That's right. What did God purpose for us to be before creation ever was? That we should be holy. No, we should be Christianity. We should be holy. Non-denominational. Holy. Mormon. Holy. Muslim. We should be holy. Hindu. Holy. Christian scientists. We should be holy. Five percenters. We should be holy. Nation of Islam. We should be holy. Christian scientists. We should be holy. Scientology. We should be holy. Baptist. Holy. Buddhist. Holy. Amen. Amen. Before the foundation of the world. There is no religion in the world. Hallelujah. That goes back before the world itself. That's right. You talk to everyone that wish up in some religion. That's They'll it. tell you, my religion started such and such. It's been around for uh, uh, seven centuries. Yeah. My religion been around for 300 centuries. That's right. My religion been around with this. My religion been around for that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's right. If your religion come from God. Yes. There is no date to the intelligence of God. No, no. Do you not know religion? The teaching of religion is supposed to be the teaching of God. That's right. And God's lessons have no beginning. That's right. You have a beginning by coming from the womb of your mothers. Gee. And then you're introduced to the lessons that always was. That's right. That you may have a beginning walking in the lessons of God. That's right. God first, you're next. That's right. And the lessons is with him oh, yeah. passed down to you. Oh, yes. Yay! Hallelujah. When God wants man to know something and he reveals something to man, the revelation didn't start when it was given to man. No. The knowledge of it already exists. Already. That's right. Because it's in the mind of God. That's it. And That's God right. wants man to carry his intelligence. Yes. His thinking. That's why God knowledge is so infallible, so broad, so big. Oh, yes. Any man he choose to represent his intelligence, he don't give that man all that information at one time. No. no. He give it to him gradually. Right. Until the scripture says it this way. Line upon line. Upon line. He didn't say read between the lines. No. no, line upon line. When a preacher tell you read between the lines, let's let's try it. Try it. Open your Bible. Let's, I'm going to try that, Pastor. And look at the first sentence of any verse you are. I'm in Isaiah chapter 28 and, and at look 10. at the sentence under that verse. Mm -hmm. And if you read between the, each line, mm -hmm. it ain't nothing there. 
Yes. But a blank space. That's right. So anytime a man tell you, read between the lines, he's telling you, get nothing. That's right. It's a blank space. That's right. So God ain't never advised you or me to read between some lines. <laughs> no. This is what God advised. Isaiah chapter 28 and read verse 10. That's what? For precept must be upon precept. Precept. Precept, precept must be upon precept. Explanation must be upon explanation. Precept upon precept. And what? Line, line upon line. Upon line. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little. You got to break down the first line here a little. And there and a little. And then when you go to the second line, you got to explain that there a little. That's right. And make the first line and the second line harmonize, That's which right. gives you a complete understanding of the verse you're dealing with. That's it. But when you go between the lines, blank space. Blank space. White space. Blank. No information between. That's right. Any line. That's right. Are you getting the old troublemaker? Amen. Amen. Go back to where we were. Now let's go to the found. Everybody all right? Back in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. Listen. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you live after your own pleasure, you shall die. In other words, God will destroy you. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify. If ye through the will of God do mortify. The deeds of the body. The performance of your will. Ye shall live. You will have life. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Hear this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. Many. As are led. Hold it. Many as are led. led. Many as are guided. Mm. Many that's directed. That's it. What? For as many as, as are led. Many that are led. By the Spirit of by God. By the Spirit of God. They. They are the are sons of God. The sons of God or they are the servants of God. That's right. Now. Is God leading mm. you? That's it. Haven't you been in some churches, some crackerjack churches? <laughs> That's right. Everybody from pulpit down said the Lord is leading me. Leading me. The Lord is leading me. That's right. How do you define the leading of the Lord? Leading. Is it a feeling in your gut? Yeah. You may just, your bowels just may be backed up. Come on, How do you define the leading of the Lord? Leading. Is it a dream? Mm. You could have ate too many beans. That's right. Cabbage. That's right. How do you define the leading of the Lord? Leading. They are the sons of God. Sons of God. The leading of the Lord is when my deeds coincide with the moving of God and God don't move me to do anything That's right. that contradict book of scripture. That's right. That's right. God led Moses yes. to lead Israel. To lead Israel. God led Abraham. Uh -huh. That's right. Introduce law of circumcision. Yes. That's right. God led Israel yeah. out of the land of Egypt. God led or dealt with Abraham. It was God's will. That's right. Because Sarah was barren. That's right. And he went to his Egyptian uh, handmaiden, Hagar. Yeah. That's it. And the book of scripture says Sarah is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Hagar is Arabia. Arabia. Are you listening? That's right. So Israel or Jerusalem and Arabia, the Arabs, had the same father. That's right. Which is Abraham, but come from different mothers. That's right. But suppose to bow to the same God. Same God. 
Are you listening? That's right. There's only one God for the universe. That's oh, yes. Right. And if there's one God for the universe, then there's no reason to have all these variety of religions. That's right. That's right. Because God don't give us a display of a smorgasbord of religion. No. Are you listening? That's right. What did he say? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Being led, guided, directed, directed. by God's Spirit. They are the sons of God. Amen. Amen. A lot of people take matters in their own hands. That's right. And say the Lord dealt with them to do this, hmm. to start the other, yeah. to go here. That's how a lot of men got in the pulpit. That's right. Because if the Lord leads you to do his will, yeah. then the Lord will prosper you when you are obedient yeah. to his will. That's right. Did you hear what I said? That's right. When the Lord lead you to do his will, he led Abraham yeah. to yeah. offer up Isaac. Oh, yeah. Challenging Abraham, faith in him. That's right. And Abraham went on. When went, went, I mean, he went on. Oh yeah. And then God provided. God provided. A ram in the bush. That's right. That's right. But he challenged Abraham. Yeah. So when you say the Lord is leading you, leading you. I have met men by the hundreds. Yeah. Who always claim the Lord is leading them. Yes. And when I look at the so-called leading that they say they have. Hmm. Uh -huh. And they say the Lord is leading them. That's from right. the book. From the book. If the Lord. That's right. Is leading you from the book. From the book. Then your actions and your beliefs. Yeah. Should not contradict the book. That's right. That's right. How many religious leaders of practically every sick religion in the world hmm. have used some religious book, some book. to disguise their sinful actions as the leading of the Lord? Oh, Remember Lord. Jim Jones? Yeah. I was a child in junior high school. They call it middle school now. Uh -huh. In the 1970s, when Jim Jones took his blind congregation to Guyana. Yeah. Received them into believing that the Lord led yeah. him to take them there. Yeah. And they all drunk poison. A few escaped. Yeah. But because they had confidence in him, because they didn't know the Lord for themselves. That's right. And this is what empowers pulpit liars. That's right. They don't teach you God for a reason. Right. The knowledge of God, I want everybody to hear me real good. The reason why men in the pulpits of America and the world they focus on teaching you community service. Yeah. That's good. All right. Helping your brother when he's down. That's good. That's good. Your next door neighbor need a cup of sugar, give them <laughs> some sugar. That's right. Nice. Nice. Hmm. Hmm. But most religions uh -huh. don't teach you who is God, who is God? No. what is God. That's right. Because if you don't come into the knowledge of who God is, then you will always live in ignorance of who you are. That's right. Do you not know the knowledge of God brings you into the knowledge of yourself? yourself. The knowledge of God brings self-awareness. That's right. For it is the knowledge of God that teaches you what you're here for. 
That's right. He said, I made you for my glory. And if you don't know that, you will just think you're here to party, drink, smoke, knock up women, knock up men, gamble, act like a fool. That's right. But when you realize that you was made for God's glory, now there's a law hanging over your head. Yeah. That's right. Now there's a will. You got a purpose in life. That's right. And your very first purpose should not be a career. No. No. Your first purpose should be obeying God. That's it. That's right. You see, if my first purpose is to obey God, then when I pursue that career, I don't pursue a career that is in contradiction of God. Of God. That's right. Because I come into the knowledge of God who brought me into the awareness of myself. That's and right. I understand what I'm here for. Now I can serve him. Yeah. Not ignorantly, but wisely. Wisely. My decision making is better because I can decide now according to his thinking. That's right. Places I go now, I can change them because now I will only go where it pleases him. That's right. Are you listening? That's right. Now when I pray, I know how many to pray to. That's it. Because I came into the knowledge of him, not them. Not them. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. These three are one. It ain't no three. No. It's just one. Just one. Who has many operations. That's right. You can't put no cap on God's ability. No, no. One God makes the heaven. That's right. One God, one God. makes the earth. Yeah. One God controls the elements. That's right. Bring a flood in one area. Summertime in another. Yeah. yeah. Bring snow on the mountains. That's right. And bring heat in the valley. Behold, God is great. What? God is great. In Job 36 and verse 26. God is great. God is what? God is great. The Arabs said, Allah hu That's right. Allah who art God yeah. is the greatest. Oh, yes. And the Bible says, Behold, God is great. Oh, I agree. Oh, yes. Amen. Who's more greater than him? Who's more greater? So none of the prophets set the standard. No, no. God set the standard and then revealed the standard to the prophets. That's right. And then don't allow no prophet no apostle to mix their personal views no. with God's standard. No, no. Are you listening? That's right. Hear this. Behold, God is great. God is great. And we know him not. We know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on to say, I know how old who God is and I know how much of a fool you are. <laughs> That's right. God That's right. is great. Great. And what? And we know him not. And we don't know him. Hold it. Come on, Jay. Come on, say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Jay. That's a contradiction. Because the prophets knew him. There is no prophet, no apostle, that have all the understanding of God. No way. That's what it means we know him not. We know him not. We only know what he make known to us. That's right. For the Bible says this, the secret thing belong to God. belongs to God. Belong to yeah. God. So you only know what he allow you to know. That's it. That's what that is. That's it. Glory to God. Behold, God is great. God. Hallelujah. Mm, mm, mm. That's something. I mean, look how great he is. Great he is. You see the highest mountain in the world. Yes. And here in the days of Noah, the waters rose 15 cubits above the highest above mountain. The highest mountain. Yeah. 
Look how great God is. Look at yourself. That's right. A product of God's creation. That's right. That's right. Scientists and others rather credit evolution. Yes. Which is a lie that the devil introduced to degrade and belittle God. So Satan has set up religion right. for one reason. Not only to deceive people, but for the belittlement of God. That's right. That's why they say it's more than one. Yeah. To try to take away from him his greatness of being the almighty. That's right. That's right. Are you listening? Behold, God is great. Glory to God. And we know Hallelujah. him not. God is great. Is great. And we know him and not. And we don't know how great God is. Neither can the number of his years be Neither searched out. Neither does he have a birthday. That, that's it. That's right. That's because right. when you born, you get numbers to your years. <laughs> that's it. But God ain't born. No. Well, Pastor Jennings, what about Jesus Christ being God? That flesh and blood that Mary birthed wasn't God. No. God was in Christ Jesus. That's right. Mary ain't the mother of God. No. Mary was the mother of the servant of God or the son of God or the Messiah. That's it. God ain't never have a mother. No. 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 What woman can birth God? That's right. I mean, think of it. Every child have a certain amount of weight. But God, the scripture says he is higher than heaven, deeper than hell, broader than the sea, and longer than the earth. It ain't a woman womb that big. <laughs> That's right. All right, That's listening. Right. That's right. That's right. So the spirit of Christ that was in the son of man, the flesh and blood was the flesh or the flesh of Christ. That's it. And the spirit of Christ was in the flesh of Christ. That's it. The spirit that was in Christ Jesus, that was God. To win that but God. The flesh itself was the son That's of it. the living God. That's what do you mean, son of God? That don't mean that God came down to have sex with no woman. No. No. That's right, Logan. God has sex God. with a woman? That's right. He's called son of God, which means servant of God or minister of God. That's it. For the book tells us that we are That's right. the, the sons, sons of, God. of God. What do you mean? We are the servants, servants. of the most high God. Uh, behold, God is great. Do you hear this? Now in Job 36 and verse 26. Look. God is great. God is great. And we know him not. You don't know him. Neither can the number of his years be searched the out. The number of his years cannot be searched out. For he maketh small the drops of water. <laughs> he makes small. Yeah. The drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof. Pour down rain according to the vapor. Which, which the clouds do drop and distill which upon man clouds, abundantly. Listen, which the clouds do drop. And distill upon man abundantly. And distill upon man abundantly. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds? Can any understand the spreading? Of the clouds. Of the clouds. Or, once, another scripture says the clouds are the dust of his feet. Or the noise of his tabernacle. Or the noise of God's tabernacle. Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it. And he spread his light upon it. And covereth the bottom of the sea. He covers the bottom of the sea. Of the sea. Amen. God is, God is just too deep for man. Oh, yes. To comprehend. That's right. Even when God revealed himself to man. And make himself known to man who he is. Who he is. After man explain and teach that God given revelation That's with right. a God given explanation, yes. God is deeper than that. That's right. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. What? Touching the Almighty. Listen at this. Now in Job chapter 37 and verse 23. Touching the Almighty. The Almighty. We cannot find him out. 
Hallelujah. Not even the Bible itself. That's right. Give you all the information about God. That's right. It ain't a religious book on the it's planet book. that can tell you everything about God. That's right. God is bigger than the actual revelations That's that right. he gave to man about himself. That's right. That's true. There ain't a relig- the Bible don't give you all the information. The Quran don't give it to you. The Torah don't give it to you. No. Because God is bigger than all those books put together. That's right. That's right. You can have a bunch of Bibles. You can have a bunch of Qurans. You can have a bunch of Torahs of every translation under the sun. But God is bigger than all of it. Yeah, that's right. Because the prophets can only say what God make known to them. Oh, yes. There are secret things that belong to God that no man know. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Do you hear this? In Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. This is the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 29. The Old Testament, verse, chapter 29. And verse 29. Verse 29 the says. The secret things. Secret. Secret. Private. Yes. Go ahead, man. That's right. Private things. Private, that's right. Only reserved for God. That's right. He don't want you to know. That's it. Too deep for you. Oh, yes. Can't handle it. You can't even obey what you already know. That's true. You're struggling trying to obey what knowledge you have. That's right. So God hold back things. That's right. Just for himself. That's right. Do you hear this? The secret things. The private things. Belong unto the Lord our God. Belong just to him. But those things which are revealed. But those things which are made known. Belong unto us. And to our children forever. Do you hear this? That's right. That's right. The things that are revealed. Belong unto us. It belongs to us to shape us. And to our children forever. To shape us, to shape our children, to shape the generations that come after us, to mold us, to fashion us after his likeness. That we may do all the words of this law. Hallelujah. These things are revealed to us for what reason? That we may do all the words. That we may words perform the information we get. Of this law. Of this law. And the Bible says this in the book of Joshua. This book of the law. The law. Shall not depart out of thine mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein yeah. day and night. Day and night. Yeah. To observe. To, to do. do according to all that is written therein. That's it. Then the Lord say, I will make thine way prosperous. prosperous and thou shalt have good success. good success. Prosperity is not houses, land, money, and cars. No. True prosperity is the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding of who God is, how to obey him, That's how it. to serve him, and how to live for him. That's it. That's right. That's right. That's right. I care nothing about the amount of money you have. No. You can be rich. Oh, yes. But in God's eyes, you're poor. You're poor. That's right. True riches is not materialism. Oh, no. True riches, True riches is giving God servitude. That's right. Until the scripture says it this way 2 Corinthians yes. chapter 4. Chapter 4. Let's see what kind of treasure we have. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Begin at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking not in walking craftiness. craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing, committing ourselves. ourselves to every man conscious in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light, Lest of, the the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, of Christ who, who is the, image, is the of image of God, shall shine unto them. But we preach not ourselves. But we preach not not ourselves but Christ Jesus but the Lord Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus for sake, God who commanded the who light, command the light to, shine to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart hallelujah glory to God has shined in our heart to give the to light of the knowledge the light of the knowledge wait a minute light is what of the knowledge hallelujah that's why so many of you religious are in the dark that's right only the knowledge of God That's right. is light. Light. That's right. That's the right. knowledge of men is dark. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. The knowledge of God light. is light. Light. And the knowledge of God comes in stages. That's right. 
For it says the path of the just That's right. is as a shining light that shine more and more and more and more unto the perfect day. To the perfect day. So the light of God come in stages. That's right. What is that perfect day? The light and the knowledge of God will be given right up until the time of the arrival of the Lord. That's right. That's when the ultimate infallible light comes. That's it. In person. That's right. Hallelujah. Are you listening? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness and what? has shined in our hearts to do what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God uh -huh. in the face of Jesus Christ. What do we have? But we have this treasure. Wait. Hallelujah. We have this treasure. Treasure. Nice. This treasure. We have this treasure. This information where? In earthen vessels. It's in here. That's it. Your earthly vessel is your body. That's right. Your earthly vessel is your temple. That's right. So the treasure of God is the valuable, precious wisdom and knowledge and understanding, the information of God. That's right. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In your body. That the excellency of the power. Wait a minute. Hallelujah. How good is God's power? The excellency it's excellent. of the power. May be of God. May be of God. And not of us. So you can't go to seminary school and some Bible college and come out with the wisdom of God. That's right. Nah, That's right. you oh, go to no. seminary school and some dumb Bible college, That's you'll right. come out with a dumb dog degree. That's right. That's right. The wisdom of God come from God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You can graduate and be a Ph.D. and a D.D. all you want. All you want. But the wisdom of God is from above. That's right. Yes. Because God's wisdom is a gift. But where shall wisdom be found? Do you hear this? In Job chapter 28 and verse where 12. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is and the, place, where of is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof. Man don't know how valuable it is. Neither is it found in, Neither the, land is it found the, in the land of the living. The depth saith. That you can go down to the sea. But what did the depth say? It is not in me. Oh, it's not there. And the sea saith. And the sea saith. It is not with me. It is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold. You can't buy it. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. Hallelujah! The wisdom of God itself Hallelujah. is valuable, oh, more gosh. valuable than the weight of gold. That's right. That's right. That's right. So when men strike oil and got all this wealth, all right, fine. Fine. But if I have God, oh, yes. I have more than any oil tycoon That's right. in the world. That's right. Let me strike scripture. Come on. <laughs> That's it. Come on, and let the wisdom of God spring up. That's it. Yes. That Hallelujah. I may be rich. That's right. With the wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Oh, yeah. That's it. That wisdom converts my house. Yeah. Mm. Right. It converts my temple. Oh, yes. It converts the man part of me. That's it. They that are led. They that are led. By the Spirit of God. They that are led by the presence of God. They are the sons of God. Wonderful. Since the day God revealed himself to us many years ago. Oh, yes. We have followed that without deviation. That's, That's right. right. I don't respect no man's religion. That's right. I respect what God says. That's, That's it. Right. That's right. When you come tell me what your religion is and tell me it's been around 700 years, 30 years, <laughs> two yeah. days. Yeah. Amen. My question is always, always, is God religion your religion? That's it. Right. Now, if your answer is yes, then I'm going to ask you to give me your religious book where the Lord declared himself That's right. to be what you are. What you are. Right. That's right. You Mormons out there, the Lord ain't never told you he's a Mormon. No. 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 Some old demon appeared to your founder, Joseph Smith, in New York. Yeah. That's, right. That's right. Where you found some fake tablets under a rock. <laughs> That's right. That's true. You should have took out prudential insurance and got a piece of the rock. That's right. <laughs> 
You come all late on the scene. Come all late. Way late. All of your religions yeah. came late. Came late. Yes. Sure. Right. What is God? What is God? That's my question to you, religious people yeah. and religious leaders. Mm -hmm. What is God? What is God? That's it. Whatever religion you profess, then God, if you say they come from God, then God should be of that religion. That's true. That's right. And then declare himself to be it. To be that. That's right. Is God a Baptist? Is God a Buddhist? Is, is God Pentecostal? Is God apostolic? Is, is God non-denominational? Is God Lutheran? Is God a seven-day Adventist? Is God... A Mormon uh, is God diagnostic. Is God uh, Pentecostal? Uh, is God uh, a Muslim? I remember me. I, I, there's loads of Muslims that watch this program, and we often get into dialogue. And I remember I asked a Muslim many years ago. I said, "Brother, let me ask you a question." I said, "Is God a Muslim?" He said, "Alhamdulillah." <laughs> he said, "Brother." I he said, I never had that question posed to me before. He said, brother, alhamdulillah. He said, I never thought of that. He said, yes, brother. <laughs> he said, now that you ask that God Almighty Allah is, is a Muslim. <laughs> I said, what do Muslim mean? He said, Muslim means one that submits to God. I say, if God is a Muslim, who does he submit to? That's right. He looked, he said, I say, you know and I know almighty God submits to no one. Nobody. He said, Brother Jennings, wow, you got me, man. Hear me, world? Yes! That's right. Whatever religion you profess That's right. is your Lord. Is your Lord. Professing to be of that same belief. That's right. That's right. You church people. You got all these crucifixes in your churches with all this idolatry. Angels all up and down your walls. That's right. Little angels, little black angels, white angels with curly hair and little fat pudgy knees like they were 10 pounds. That's right. Little statues of Joseph and Mary and cattle. <laughs> you blind priests that got chains around your neck. Around your People head. filling beads, praying yeah. to Mary. Mary don't know you and you don't know her. That's For the right. book says the dead know of nothing. Know of nothing. Pope come in town. You bow down at his feet. We bow to no man. That's right. Only God we bow to. That's it. That's right. That's right. They say, oh, this man is spewing out hatred. No, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. That's right. We don't bow down at no man and kiss his feet. No way. No way. You shouldn't be bowing down to no preacher. Muslims should not be bowing down to no imam. Jews should not be bowing down to no rabbi. That's right. That's right. Every human under the sun must bow to God. To God. Yes. Who in the world would get offense over this but somebody who wants to be worshipped other than God? That's right. This poison, poison that has contaminated so-called houses of worship, yeah. where men now want to stand in the place of God. That's right. They want to be worshipped. Yeah. They want to be prayed to. Want songs made about them. That's right. And this contamination is spreading, but I'm determined to blast it to hell. Blast it back. Right. 
Remember what the book of scripture says. Romans 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit if of God. If you are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Then you are a servant of God okay. and your servitude. Yeah. Service that you render. Yeah. Will not violate the teaching that Jesus That's right. revealed or gave to his apostles. That's right. The message that the Lord gave to the prophets. That's right. Your service will not contradict it. That's right. You won't go out and murder and kill. That's right. No. no. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Because they're doing it now. That's right. Scriptures tattooed all on them, going into crazy places. Yeah. Mm. In the name of Jesus Christ, I murder you. That's right. Yea, the time cometh. And listen, now what they've done is in the Bible. That's right. And Jesus prophesied about it. St. John chapter 16 and at verse 2. Listen at the teaching of Jesus. They shall put you out of the synagogue. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh. The time come. That whosoever killeth you. Whosoever murder you. Will think that. Will think. That he doeth God's service. That he's doing God's will. I told you. That's right. And these things will they do You will unto think you. you're doing it. The That's Bible right. didn't never say you're doing it. No. Think. It says you think you're doing think. it. Think. That's right. These crazy so-called Christians. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Murdering you, stabbing you, cutting you. Yeah. Raping you. Oh, yes. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Are you listening? That's right. When you're led of God, led by the Spirit of God, He don't lead you around the Scriptures. No, He leads you to the Scriptures. That's right. And if you're honest and sincere at all, God will lead you to the Book of Truth. That's right. And to the message of truth, that you may live by the precepts of God, that you will love the truth. That's right. Amen. That's right. When you love the truth, you will love God. Oh, yes. Because God will tell you the truth about yourself. About yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. You may go behind doors and smoke your weed and drink your beer and drink your liquor and live together, not married. And then go to church singing about Jesus or go to the mosque. Or go to the synagogue and read the Torah and bouncing your head back and forth. But one thing about God, buddy, you can't fool him. That's right. That's right. He know whether you a man carrying that Bible. He know whether you a man wearing that loose garment. He know no. whether you a man and you got them locks in your hair oh, reciting yes. the Torah. That's right. For your reciting the Torah ain't me. Don't mean the head of a dog. Yeah. And you knocking up some man and you a rabbi. Mm. Come on, Jerry. No. You reading from the Quran don't mean nothing. No. And you knocking up some man and you claim you a Muslim man. Claim you. That's right. You going to church with the Bible don't mean nothing. Yeah. You bouncing around saying about Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you stuck in a man's rump. My God, my God. Am I right? Yeah. Mm. My God, my God. Mm. That's right. Mm. Preach that, man. Preach that. That's why they don't like us. That's right. And if God make you a minister, you're not out to be liked. No. You're out to speak truth. That's right. This homosexual epidemic have took the world by storm. Yes, you have. 
And every religion under the sun has people in it that are professing homosexuality. That's right. Many, 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 many years ago, before I met many of you, we did a lesson on homosexuality. Yeah. And I had some large flyers made. Here we blew them up for me. And it was naming the different religious groups who tried to hide under their religion and still said they are homosexuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe one of the largest Jewish synagogues in Pennsylvania, homosexual, rainbow flags. Yeah. Churches, Churches, rainbow flags. That's right. And some years ago, me and some imam was talking, and I showed them the article that we, in my, my research team, found. The opening prayer to the Quran, if I'm pronouncing it right, is called the Ar Fataha. There was some homosexuals that hijacked, and that's the best word I can use, hijacked that heading. Yeah. And got a mosque or got a building and named it a mosque mm. and called it the Al Fataha homosexual mosque. My Lord. You see, no religion is spared. That's right. Satan is filthy. Yes, he is. And Satan's objective is to dirty, dirty, to make God look dirty. That's right. That's right. And if you preachers and rabbis and imams are scared yeah. to say anything about it, That's right. sit down in your churches, yeah. sit down in your mosque, and sit down in your synagogue. That's right. Because God ain't never sent a scared representative of him. That's right. If you're led of God, That's you will right. believe and submit to the language of God, the intelligence of God, the statutes, standards, precepts, ordinances, commandments That's right. of the God of heaven and earth. That's right. All those commandments and will and purpose was demonstrated when God was manifested in the flesh and Jesus Christ walked this earth and left such a pattern. pattern. He left such a pattern, such an example. Example. Until he said he'd leave us, us an example that, that we should follow. follow his steps. That's it. It is written, a good man's steps is ordered by the Lord. For he directs his path. Thank you for listening, brothers and sisters. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, sinners who have not yet obeyed what the Lord declared out of you. That's right. Repenting of your sins, being sorry from in here. Yeah. And getting yourself right with God. Being baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, not like some old Catholic church being sprinkled. You go to a Catholic church, that man throw water on you, throw it back on him. <laughs> Let that crook know I took a bath already. Right. If you took it. That's right. Acts 38 says. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent. And be baptized, baptized every one of you. in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin. What did he promise? And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy he Ghost. Ye shall be filled with the Spirit of God. You men and the women that's out here just smoking and drinking and acting like a fool, living together, not married, and gang banging and murdering and all this stuff. Look, man and woman, God's way has been designed to make you better. That's right. On your own, you can't be better. No. See, when God teach you, young man and old man, you don't have long hair like a girl. That's right. You don't be walking around with no man bun. Man bun. 
You got your girlfriend bobby pins in your head Amen. or your wife rubber band. I never thought I'd see it today where men walk around with a man bun. That's right. What's the matter with you? Come on. I'm from the hood. Yeah. I'm from North Philly, Jack. Nice. We got out there and mixed it up. Ain't no one had no buns. No. If I saw that man bun was shaking, I, I couldn't even mix it up serious. I'd be like, That's right. I'm from the hood, man. We, we mixed it. That's right. Come on. Nobody can take your bobbing head man bun serious. No. That's right. Talk back to me. Oh, yeah. That's what Satan done to us men. Oh yeah. He put a lot of femininity in you, take your masculinity away from you, and he reversed it for women. Right. Took the feminine away out of them. Yeah. Man, it's hard to find a woman with feminine character. Oh yeah. Even the women's like, it was up. <laughs> How you doing, sister? Yo! What's up, dog? Yo! That's right. Talk to a man. Hey, what's happening, brother? Everything is all right. It's all right. Everything is in reverse. Oh, yes. This is why I challenge the governments of the world. And so many organizations that have put contracts out on us to have us killed. Yeah. Big time mega preachers like TD Jakes contact the FCC to have us banned off the air. Yeah. They say we too militant. Even the government of, of Australia, the government met and discussed us. They finally, they finally sent me papers yeah. and said I can come. Wow. Yeah. Man. They finally sent me. I'm going to be nice, G. I'm going to be nice. Did I get that? My Lord, my Lord. While I'm here, I'm just going to slap box with Australia. But when I get there, Go ahead, brother. Got a letter from Australia. Wow. Parliament. Some of the officials of Parliament had a, and I was the topic. Wow. They actually banned me from the whole continent. <laughs> That's right. Wow. That's then we something. kept petitioning, kept petitioning, kept petitioning. Our ministers over there was working, secretaries over here working, so we finally got two, two letters said I can come, but then my secretary highlighted the other area so I don't miss it. They fear that I will incite a riot. I ain't gonna incite a riot. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because Australia is loyal to homosexuality. Government officials threatening countries to penalize them here in America. Yeah. The officials of America, including the president, right. have threatened islands of the Caribbean and African countries, threatening to sanction them. If they don't accept same-sex marriages, they will set an embargo to keep certain medical supplies and certain foods from coming into that country. I tell you, America is a dirty country. Amen. But the ambassador of Africa was on CNN. And I believe it was Don Lemon that was interviewing him at the time. And the African ambassador said, no, Africa don't carry on like this. Right. We will not 
tolerate these actions in Africa. Amen. He said, it's filthy. It's just filthy. Beard with beard. Mustache with mustache. It's something. It's something. Listen, when you can't even do wrong the right way. The right way. There's a right way to do wrong. That's right. That's right. So I hope Australia don't change their mind. That's right. <laughs> I hope. I'm going to be nice, G. <laughs> Until I get there. When you get there. When I get there, it's swinging. Swinging then. Oh, yes. Anybody want to obey the word of God and be baptized in water? Oh, in the yes. name of Jesus Christ, like the word of God requires, stand on your feet if you want it today. Wonderful. All of you that are standing, go to the back, please. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. All praise is due unto God. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? God is great. God is great. God himself. Worthy to be praised. We're glad for all of our visitors that took the time out to come. Hallelujah. This is the most popular religious program that comes out of any church. Not just here in America, but the world. This is the program that so many of other religions watch it and respect it. I've talked to many rabbis and many imams. One imam said, you're the only preacher in the church that I encourage our followers to watch. He said, if you know anything about the Quran, Pastor Genesis, and he said, I know you do. He said, the Bible called the Christian the people of the book. I said, well, Hallelujah. these people out here today, they ain't of the book. Oh, no. They're of the devil. Yeah. That's right. So we are grateful to see the many brothers and sisters ready to go down in the water in the name of the Lord Jesus. We're going to ask you to come back at 5.30. 5.30, yes, brother. Yes, sir. We're going to ask you to come back at 5.30. God be our helper. Let us all stand. Come on, brother. Let us pray with you, then we'll pray with everybody. Everlasting God, we thank you for our brother that is standing here. In the name of the Lord Jesus, look down upon him. You said in the book of scriptures that if one be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thine self, lest thine also be tempted. We ask you to forgive him of every sin and every transgression, and we are grateful that you didn't cut him off while he was out there in his sins. Let your mercy and your peace be upon him, that he may have a desire to walk with the truth, and be humble and obey the same, and be dedicated to your divine will and purpose. These blessings we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes? What's that? Yes. Yes. Right. God don't have to submit to no will. When God do his will, there's nothing that he's submitting to. Submit means to give servitude. N 
No. He's just God. All right? All right. Under him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power both now and forever. Let the brothers and sisters say, Amen. Amen. See you at.
Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I would like to thank God for allowing us to come together, even from different corners of the world, to delve into His Word. Thank God for sending a leader like Pastor Gino Jennings. It is a blessing to witness how technology can bridge the physical divide and unite us in our pursuit of spiritual growth and understanding. I want to personally thank each one of you for tuning in and devoting your time and attention to this study. Your eagerness to learn and explore the depths of Scripture is truly inspiring. I hope and pray that you have found value in today's discussion, that it has touched your heart, and that you have gained insights that will shape your faith journey. Remember, the Bible is an endless wellspring of wisdom. And as we continue our virtual gatherings, my earnest desire is that we continue to learn together, grow together, and be transformed by the timeless truths it holds. I encourage you to keep seeking the truths of God's Word and to apply them in your daily lives, allowing them to shape your thoughts, words, and actions. I want to extend an open invitation to subscribe for Bible studies, biblical news, sermons, and more. Together, we will embark on a new chapter, exploring new passages and delving deeper into the mysteries of God's plan for our life. Let us continue to build a community where we can support and uplift one another in our spiritual journeys. Once again, I am truly grateful for your presence and participation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, guiding you, and bringing you peace. Take care, and may God bless each and every one of you abundantly. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of repentance in our Christian walk. Repentance is not just a one-time event that happens when we first come to Christ but it is a continual process of turning away from sin and turning towards God. The Bible teaches us that repentance is necessary for salvation. In Acts 2, 38, Peter said to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit without first repenting of our sins and turning towards God. Repentance involves a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of direction. It means acknowledging our sinfulness and turning away from our sinful ways. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Paul writes, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sins, but it is a genuine sorrow that leads us to turn away from sin and towards God. Repentance is also a key component of sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ. In Romans 12, 2, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Repentance is a part of renewing our minds and transforming our hearts to be more like Christ. It is important to remember that repentance is not just for the unsaved. Even as Christians, we still struggle with sin and we must continually repent and turn towards God. In Revelation 2, 5, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. We must constantly evaluate our lives and turn away from sin, returning to our first love for Christ. In conclusion, repentance is an essential part of our Christian walk. It is necessary for salvation, sanctification, spiritual growth, and maturity. It involves a change of heart, mind, and direction, turning away from sin and towards God. As we continue to walk with Christ, let us continually examine our hearts, confess our sins, and turn towards God in repentance. May we strive to live a life that is pleasing to God and brings glory to His name. Amen.
Heavenly Father. In the sacred quietude of this moment, we come before your throne, hearts yearning for the transformative touch of your grace. Lord, we lift up those souls in our church who in the depths of their being feel the stirring call of salvation. Your word reminds us in Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, A Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today, we intercede on behalf of those who long for this profound salvation experience. God, the great pursuer of hearts, we acknowledge that salvation is not a human achievement, but a divine gift. In Ephesians 2, we are reminded, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. We thank you for this unmerited favor, this wondrous gift of salvation that transcends our shortcomings and frailty. Lord Jesus, you proclaimed in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We come with hearts humbled, acknowledging you as the sole source of salvation. May those who seek redemption find solace in the truth that you are the way, guiding their steps into the embrace of the Father's love. We lift up those wrestling with questions, doubts, and the complexities of faith. In their seeking, may they find reassurance in your promise in Jeremiah 29. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. May their sincere seeking lead to a profound encounter with your truth, grace, and love. Holy Spirit, as the divine convictor and comforter, draw near to those whose hearts are tender to the call of salvation. Create a sacred space within them, a space receptive to your transformative power. In John 16, we are reminded, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. May this conviction be a gentle nudge toward the pathway of salvation. We pray for the evangelists and ministers within our church that they may be vessels of your anointing and convey the message of salvation with clarity, compassion, and anointing. As they share the good news, may it fall on receptive hearts and may the seeds of faith take root and flourish. Lord, for those who may be burdened by the weight of guilt and sin, remind them of the promise in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. May the liberating truth of your forgiveness bring a profound sense of relief and renewal. In this sacred journey of salvation, we pray for the establishment of genuine community and fellowship. In Acts 2, it is written, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. May our church be a place where those seeking salvation find a nurturing community, united in the bonds of faith, love, and shared purpose. For those facing spiritual battles, wrestling with darkness, and contending with the enemy's whispers, we invoke the truth of James 4, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. May the armor of your word and the power of your name be their refuge and strength in moments of temptation. Lord, for those with hardened hearts or preconceived notions, break through the barriers with the transforming power of your love. As Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, may they be rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We pray for those who may be wrestling with the fear of judgment. May they discover the liberating truth of Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. May the realization of your grace dispel the shadows of guilt allowing them to step into the radiant light of your love. In this journey towards salvation, we recognize the power of testimony. As David proclaimed in Psalm 51:12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. May the testimonies of transformed lives within our church be a compelling narrative of your redemptive power, drawing others into the joy of salvation. As we pray for the seekers, we also pray for those who have known your salvation but may have wandered away. Like the prodigal son, may they sense the beckoning of your embrace and, with repentant hearts, return to the safety of your love. In the grand narrative of salvation, we celebrate the reality that your grace extends beyond our church walls, reaching into the corners of the world. May our hearts be aligned with your heart for the lost. And may our church be a beacon of hope and salvation for those who have yet to hear the good news.
May the anthem of salvation echo through the halls of our church, and may it resound in the hearts of those who are seeking. As we stand united in faith, we declare with joy the truth of Psalm 3.8, From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. The Communion of Saints Reflecting God's Glory Through Unity Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we delve into the profound teachings of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, specifically focusing on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In this chapter, Paul addresses the importance of the Lord's Supper, also known as communion, and the manner in which it should be observed within the context of the church. As we explore this text together, let us be open to the transformative power of the Word of God and its relevance for our lives today. The Significance of Communion In the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul establishes the significance of communion, reminding the Corinthian believers of its divine origin. He affirms that he received this sacred tradition directly from the Lord himself, emphasizing its importance as a symbol of unity among believers and a means of remembering the sacrifice of Christ. Communion serves as a powerful reminder of God's grace and love manifested through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a sacred moment when we partake of the bread, representing His body broken for us, and the cup, symbolizing His bloodshed for the forgiveness of sins. As we participate in this act of remembrance, we enter into communion not only with Christ, but also with one another, forming a bond of fellowship and unity. The Call to Examine Ourselves Paul's discourse in 1 Corinthians 11 highlights the need for self-examination before partaking in the Lord's Supper. He cautions the Corinthian believers against approaching communion in a casual or irreverent manner. Instead, he encourages them to engage in introspection, evaluating their relationship with God and their fellow believers. This call to self-examination is a reminder that the Lord's Supper is not to be taken lightly. It is an opportunity for personal reflection and repentance, recognizing our own shortcomings and seeking forgiveness from God and one another. It is through this self-examination that we can approach the table with a humble and contrite heart, fully aware of the grace and mercy extended to us through Christ's sacrifice. The Unity of the Body In 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 34, Paul addresses a specific issue within the Corinthian church the divisions and factions that had emerged during their observance of the Lord's Supper. He condemns their selfish and divisive behavior, reminding them that the Lord's Supper is meant to foster unity and mutual love among believers. The communion table is a powerful symbol of our shared identity as the body of Christ. It is a tangible representation of our unity and equality before God, regardless of our backgrounds, social status, or differences. Paul urges the Corinthians to examine their hearts seeking reconciliation and unity within the body of believers. When we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are not simply partaking of bread and wine. We are participating in a sacred act of communion with Christ and our fellow believers. It is a moment when the barriers that separate us are broken down, and we are reminded of our common faith, purpose, and destiny. It is an opportunity to demonstrate the love and reconciliation that Christ has bestowed upon us reflecting His glory to the world. Dear friends, as we reflect on Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 11, let us remember the profound significance of the Lord's Supper. It is not merely a ritual or tradition. It is a sacred act that unites us with Christ and with one another. Through communion, we remember Christ's sacrifice, examine our hearts, seek reconciliation, and embrace the unity of the body. May the observance of communion be a transformative experience for us, deepening our relationship with Christ and strengthening our bonds of fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the faith. Let us approach the table with reverence, humility, and a sincere desire for unity. As we partake of the bread and the cup, may we be reminded of the immeasurable love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May His sacrifice inspire us to love one another, to seek reconciliation and unity, and to reflect His glory to a broken and divided world. Let us go forth from this place, carrying the spirit of communion within our hearts and embodying the unity of the body of Christ in our lives.
May our participation in the Lord's Supper be a continual reminder of our identity as His followers and our call to live in harmony, love, and grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Embracing God's Design Understanding and Honoring Male and Female Roles Dear Congregation, Today, we gather as a community of believers to explore an important and often debated topic, the roles of men and women. It is a subject that carries profound significance for our lives, relationships, and understanding of God's design. As we embark on this journey together, let us approach it with open hearts and minds, seeking to understand and honor the roles assigned to us by our Creator. Created in God's image, at the very core of our existence, we must recognize that both men and women are created in the image of God. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we see that God formed Adam, the first man, and then created Eve, the first woman, as his suitable helper. This divine act of creation signifies the inherent value and equality of both genders as they reflect the image of the Creator. Complementary Roles While men and women are equal in value and worth, Scripture reveals that they have been assigned complementary roles by God. These roles are not based on superiority or inferiority, but rather on the distinct gifts, strengths, and purposes woven into the fabric of our being. Understanding and embracing these roles allows us to thrive individually and harmoniously as a society. The Role of Men Throughout the Bible, we find examples of men who were called to lead in various contexts, within the family, the church, and society. This leadership role does not imply domination or oppression, but rather a responsibility to love, protect, and provide for others. Men are called to imitate Christ's sacrificial love, displaying servant leadership in their relationships, families, and communities. Husbands are specifically instructed to love their wives as Christ loved the church, laying down their lives for their spouses. This sacrificial love encompasses nurturing, honoring, and cherishing their wives, fostering an environment of trust, respect, and unity within the marriage relationship. The Role of Women While men are called to assume leadership roles, women play a vital and equally significant role in God's plan. Women are called to be helpers, as demonstrated in the creation of Eve to assist Adam. However, this term helper does not denote inferiority, but rather signifies a unique partnership and collaboration. Women are empowered to contribute their gifts, wisdom, and strengths to fulfill God's purposes. Women are called to cultivate a spirit of gentleness, wisdom, and nurturing care in their relationships, families, and communities. They have the remarkable ability to bring life, love, and compassion into every sphere they inhabit. Their influence and contributions are invaluable as they contribute to the flourishing of society. Mutual Submission and Unity While discussing gender roles, it is essential to emphasize the concept of mutual submission. In Ephesians 5 verse 21, the Apostle Paul instructs believers to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This mutual submission applies to all believers, regardless of gender, and creates an atmosphere of humility, respect, and unity within the body of Christ. Men and women are called to honor and support one another recognizing the unique roles assigned to each. Instead of fostering competition or asserting dominance, we are called to embrace a spirit of mutual love, encouragement, and cooperation. Together, we can fulfill God's purposes and reflect His image more fully. Dear brothers and sisters, as we contemplate the roles of men and women, let us remember that our understanding and application of these roles must be grounded in love, respect, and humility. We are equal in value and worth, created in the image of God, yet assigned complementary roles that reflect His divine wisdom. Men are called to lead with sacrificial love, serving as humble protectors and providers. Women are called to be helpers, partnering with men in love, wisdom, and nurturing care. Together, we form a beautiful tapestry, each thread interwoven with purpose and significance. Let us reject the notion of superiority or inferiority and embrace the call to mutual submission and unity. In doing so, we honor God's design and reflect His image more fully in our lives, families, and communities. May we approach this topic with grace and understanding, 
seeking to build bridges rather than walls, let us celebrate the unique contributions of both men and women recognizing that our roles are essential for the flourishing of society and the advancement of God's kingdom. As we go forth from this place, let us embody the principles of love, respect, and collaboration. May our relationships and interactions reflect the beauty of God's design, and may His grace empower us to fulfill our roles with joy, wisdom, and humility. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Choosing the world or God, the pursuit of true fulfillment. Dear congregation, today we gather to reflect upon a significant challenge faced by believers throughout history, choosing between the allure of the world and the call of God. It is a topic that speaks to the very core of our faith journey and the decisions we make in our daily lives. As we delve into this topic, let us open our hearts to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and seek guidance in aligning our choices with the will of our Heavenly Father the temptation of the world. In a world filled with distractions, pleasures, and worldly desires, it is easy to succumb to the allure of what the world offers. The world presents us with a tantalizing array of false promises, material possessions, worldly success, and instant gratification. These temptations often pull at the deepest desires of our hearts, luring us away from our devotion to God. The world seeks to captivate us, convincing us that true fulfillment and happiness lie in the pursuit of worldly gain. It entices us with a mirage of temporary pleasures, promising satisfaction but leaving us empty and yearning for more. In this pursuit, we risk losing sight of our eternal purpose and the profound joy that comes from a genuine relationship with God. The Consequences of Choosing the World Choosing the world over God has consequences that extend beyond temporary pleasures. It can lead to a spiritual disconnect, a sense of emptiness, and a loss of peace and contentment. By prioritizing worldly pursuits, we neglect the spiritual nourishment and growth that come from seeking God's will. Moreover, when we choose the world, we risk compromising our values, integrity, and witness as believers. Our actions and decisions may contradict the values and teachings of the gospel causing confusion and hindering our ability to be effective ambassadors of Christ's love and grace. Additionally, the world's influence can breed discontent, envy, and greed, leading to broken relationships, division, and a lack of genuine community. The Call to Choose God In the midst of the world's allure, God lovingly extends an invitation to choose Him wholeheartedly. Scripture reminds us that God is the source of true fulfillment, joy, and peace. In His presence, we find purpose, meaning, and a deep satisfaction that surpasses the temporary pleasures the world offers. Choosing God requires a deliberate shift in our priorities and perspectives. It entails seeking God's guidance through prayer, studying His Word, and engaging in fellowship with fellow believers. We must cultivate a heart that yearns for God above all else. Recognizing that true fulfillment can only be found in a vibrant and intimate relationship with Him. Navigating the tension. Living in the world while choosing God poses a delicate tension. We are called to be in the world but not of it. This requires wisdom, discernment, and a constant reliance on the Holy Spirit to guide our choices and actions. We must examine our hearts and identify the areas where the world's influence has seeped in, surrendering them to God's transforming power. As we navigate this tension, we are reminded that we have the Holy Spirit within us, empowering us to resist the world's temptations and embrace a life centered on God's truth. We are called to be salt and light, making a positive impact on the world around us by reflecting God's love, compassion, and righteousness. Dear brothers and sisters, the choice between the world and God is a decision we face daily. It is a battle for our hearts, minds, and souls. But let us be encouraged, knowing that God's grace is sufficient and His power is made perfect in our weaknesses. As we journey through life, may we continually seek God's guidance and strength, relying on His Word and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. May we resist the allure of the world and its empty promises, recognizing that true fulfillment can only be found in our Creator. Let us cultivate a heart that desires God above all else, aligning our choices and actions with His will. 
May we be intentional in our pursuit of a vibrant and intimate relationship with Him, allowing His love and grace to transform us from within. In choosing God over the world, we not only experience true fulfillment and joy, but we also become vessels of His love and ambassadors of His kingdom. May our lives be a testimony to the transforming power of God drawing others to a life devoted to Him. As we leave this place today, let us commit to making deliberate choices that align with God's truth and purpose. Let us encourage one another in this journey, offering support, accountability, and prayer. And may we continually remind ourselves of the incomparable worth and fulfillment found in choosing God above all else. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Call to Follow God, A Journey of Faith Dear Beloved Congregation, Today, we gather here as a community of faith, seeking guidance, solace, and spiritual nourishment. As we come together, let us reflect upon the profound and timeless truth that lies at the core of our existence, the call to follow God. This call transcends time and space, encompassing the lives of countless generations, it is an invitation to embark on a lifelong journey, embracing faith and allowing God to guide our steps. The Nature of God's Call When we speak of following God, we must first understand the nature of this call. It is not a mere suggestion or a passing notion. It is an imperative, a commandment woven into the fabric of our being. Our purpose in life is intrinsically linked to this call as we are created in the image of God and designed to walk in harmony with His divine will. God's call is personal and unique for each one of us. Just as He called Abraham to leave his homeland, Moses to deliver his people, and the disciples to leave everything and follow Jesus, God calls us to a specific purpose within the grand tapestry of His divine plan. This call may manifest in various ways through a still, small voice within our hearts, through the wise counsel of fellow believers, or through circumstances that align with God's providential hand. The journey of faith. Following God is not a one-time decision. It is a lifelong journey marked by faith, trust, and obedience. It is an expedition that traverses through valleys of despair, mountaintops of joy, and uncharted territories of uncertainty. Our faith is tested, refined, and deepened as we walk this path. But the promise of God's abiding presence sustains us through every twist and turn. In our journey, we encounter obstacles that seek to deter us from following God. The allure of worldly pleasures, the pressures of society, and the trials of life can distract and discourage us. However, we must remember that God's call is greater than any temporary pleasure or adversity. Through prayer, the study of His Word, and fellowship with other believers, we find the strength and wisdom to persevere. The blessings of following God. While the journey of faith may present challenges, it also brings forth immeasurable blessings. As we surrender our lives to God, He fills us with His love, grace, and peace. The presence of the Holy Spirit guides and empowers us, granting wisdom in times of confusion, comfort in times of sorrow, and strength in times of weakness. Moreover, following God aligns us with His divine purposes. As we walk in obedience, our lives become a reflection of His character, shining a light in a world marred by darkness. Our actions, driven by love and compassion, have the power to impact lives, transform communities, and bring hope to the hopeless. The Call to Discipleship Following God also entails the call to discipleship. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9 verse 23 Discipleship involves selflessness, humility, and a willingness to lay down our desires for the sake of God's kingdom. It calls us to love our neighbors, serve the marginalized, and be the hands and feet of Jesus in a broken world. Dear brothers and sisters, the call to follow God is not reserved for a select few. It is extended to all who are willing to answer. It is a call that beckons us to a higher purpose, a deeper relationship with our Creator. It is a call that transforms our lives, filling them with meaning, joy, and fulfillment. As we embark on this journey of faith, let us remember that following God is not a solitary endeavor. 
We are part of a larger community of believers, bound together by our shared commitment to follow God's call. Let us support and encourage one another, lifting each other up when we stumble and rejoicing together in our victories. May we be relentless in our pursuit of God, seeking Him with all our hearts and surrendering our lives to His divine will. In doing so, we will experience the abundant blessings that come from walking in obedience. Our lives will be transformed and we will become beacons of light, reflecting God's love and grace to a world in desperate need. As we leave this sacred space today, may we carry the fire of God's call in our hearts, and may our lives be living testimonies of His faithfulness. Let us go forth with renewed vigor and determination to follow God in every aspect of our lives, trusting that He will guide us, protect us, and lead us to the abundant life He has prepared for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Path of Following God A Journey of Faith, Trust, and Obedience Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Today we gather in the presence of the Almighty, seeking guidance and inspiration on our spiritual journey. The topic of my sermon today is one that lies at the core of our Christian faith, following God. It is a profound calling that encompasses our entire existence and shapes the very purpose of our lives. As we embark on this spiritual pilgrimage, let us reflect on the significance of following God, the challenges we may encounter, and the blessings that await us along the way. The Call to Follow At the heart of Christianity lies the call to follow God. From the very beginning, God has invited humanity into a personal relationship, desiring us to walk alongside Him. The call to follow is not limited to a select few. It extends to all who seek to embrace His love and live according to His will. It is an invitation to surrender our own desires and brace a life of faith, trust, and obedience. The challenges we encounter? While the path of following God is one of immense joy and fulfillment, it is not without its challenges. The world around us often presents distractions, temptations, and obstacles that seek to divert us from our intended course. Doubts may assail our minds, and the pressures of society can undermine our commitment. Yet, even in the face of adversity, we are reminded that God is faithful and will provide strength to overcome every trial we encounter. The Faithful Journey To embark on the path of following God requires unwavering faith. Faith that He is the Creator of all things, the source of wisdom and love, and the one who holds our lives in His hand. As we journey, we learn to trust in His divine plan, even when it seems unclear or different from our own expectations. Our faith grows stronger as we experience His faithfulness in our lives, and we find solace in knowing that He is always with us. The Obedience of Discipleship Following God necessitates obedience to His word and commandments. Obedience should not be viewed as a burden, but as an expression of our love for Him. Through obedience, we align our hearts and minds with God's divine will, allowing His transformative power to work in us. We are called to live lives of righteousness and love, exemplifying Christ's teachings and being a light in the world. In obedience, we find freedom, purpose, and true fulfillment. The blessings of following God the rewards of following God are immeasurable. By walking in His ways, we experience His presence, peace, and joy. He guides us through the darkest valleys, strengthens us in times of weakness, and brings hope to our weary souls. Following God leads us to a life of purpose and significance, where we become vessels of His love and instruments of His grace. In His hands, we find our true identity and destiny far greater than we could ever imagine. My dear brothers and sisters, as we conclude this sermon, let us remember that the call to follow God is not a one-time decision but a lifelong journey. It requires our wholehearted commitment, faith, and obedience. Along this path, we may stumble, but God's grace is ever-present to lift us up and set us on the right course. May we embrace the call to follow God with open hearts, allowing His love to transform us and may our lives be a testament to His faithfulness. Let us go forth, following our Heavenly Father, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Following God, a journey of faith and obedience. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I stand before you to share a profound message of hope, encouragement, and challenge. 
Our topic of discussion today is following God, a journey of faith and obedience. As believers, we are called to walk in the footsteps of our Lord, seeking His guidance, surrendering to His will, and living a life of obedience. Let us embark on this spiritual pilgrimage together as we explore the depths of what it truly means to follow God. The Call to Follow At the heart of our faith lies the fundamental truth that God has called us into a personal relationship with Him. He invites us to follow Him, to align our wills with His divine purpose. Just as Jesus called His disciples to leave everything and follow Him, we too are beckoned to surrender our own ambitions, desires, and plans to walk in the path set before us by our Heavenly Father. Faith, the foundation. Following God demands unwavering faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Faith requires us to trust in God's goodness, His sovereignty, and His perfect plan, even when the path seems unclear or challenging. It is through faith that we encounter the transforming power of God in our lives, and it is through faith that we are able to discern and follow His leading. Obedience, a fruit of love, Obedience is the outward expression of our love for God. When we truly love Him, we strive to obey His commands. Jesus Himself declared, If you love me, keep my commands. John 14, verse 15. Obedience requires humility, submission, and a willingness to let go of our own desires in order to align ourselves with the will of God. As we cultivate a heart of obedience, we grow in holiness and become vessels through which God's love can flow navigating the challenges. The path of following God is not always easy. It may be marked by trials, hardships, and moments of doubt. Yet, in the midst of these challenges, we find reassurance in the promises of God. He assures us that He will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13 verse 5, and that His grace is sufficient for us, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. By clinging to His Word and seeking His presence through prayer, we can find strength and encouragement to persevere. Bearing fruit. When we wholeheartedly commit ourselves to following God, our lives bear fruit. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 begin to manifest in our relationships, our attitudes, and our actions, our actions. Our lives become a testimony to the transformative power of God, drawing others to Him and inspiring them to embark on their own journey of following God. The Eternal Reward Lastly, we must remember that our journey of following God extends beyond this earthly life. As we faithfully serve Him, He promises us an eternal reward. Jesus declared in Matthew 16 verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The reward may not always be immediate or tangible, but we can trust that our faithfulness will be acknowledged and rewarded in God's perfect timing. My dear brothers and sisters, following God is not a one-time decision, but a lifelong commitment. It requires faith, obedience, perseverance, and surrender. As we embark on this journey, let's remember that we are not alone. God's presence goes before us guiding our steps and empowering us to overcome any obstacle. May we seek His face daily, study His word fervently, and listen attentively to His still, small voice. In following God, we discover our true purpose and experience the abundant life He has prepared for us. Let us encourage one another, bearing each other's burdens and spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. Together, Let us be a community of believers who shine the light of Christ, making a difference in this world. May the Holy Spirit ignite within us a passion to follow God wholeheartedly, leaving behind the distractions and temptations that seek to hinder us. May our lives be a living testament to the transformative power of faith and obedience, drawing others closer to the heart of God. Let us embrace this journey with joy, knowing that the reward of eternity awaits those who faithfully follow God. And as we continue on this pilgrimage, may we find solace in the words of Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 
heavenly Father. In the vastness of your presence, I humbly approach your throne with a heart filled with reverence and gratitude. You, O God, are the Alpha and Omega, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, and I stand in awe of your majesty. As I come before you, I am mindful of the psalmist's words in Psalm 95, 6, 7. Come, let us bow down in worship, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his Lord, I thank you for the gift of life, or the breath in my lungs, and the beating of my heart. Your creative touch is evident in the intricate details of the world around me. The blooming flowers, the rolling hills, and the melody of birdsong that fills the air. Tenti Psalm 100, Flogbor 30. It is written, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I join creation in declaring the glory of your name. As I navigate the tapestry of life, I bring before you my gratitude for the relationships that enrich my journey. Family, friends, mentors, and even acquaintances. Each person is a reflection of your love and grace. 910 reminds me of the value of companionship. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. I thank you, O Lord, for the seasons of joy and celebration where laughter is a sweet melody and shared moments become cherished memories. In Ecclesiastes 3.4, your word declares a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. May my heart be attuned to the rhythm of your timing, finding joy even in the midst of life's complexities. Yet, Lord, I also come before you with the burdens and challenges that mark the human experience. In times of uncertainty and hardship, I seek your face. Your word in Philippians 4, 6, 7 guides me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I lay before you the concerns that weigh on my heart, trusting in your peace that surpasses all understanding. I am grateful for the lessons learned through trials, recognizing that adversity has the power to shape character and refine faith. James 2.4 assures me, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In moments of weariness, I find solace in your promise to provide rest. Matthew 11 tweet, 2 Frati invites me, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Grant me, Lord, the rests that only you can give. Spring before you, O Lord, the desires of my heart, the dreams and aspirations that rest in the depths of my soul. Your word in Psalm 30 cents, Surrey. For encourages me, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. May my desires align with your will, and may my pursuits bring glory to your name. In the quiet moments of reflection, I recognize the importance of gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, your word instructs me, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. May a spirit of gratitude permeate every facet of my life, acknowledging your hand in both joys and challenges. Why lift up to you, O God, the decisions that await me, the crossroads where choices shape my journey. In Proverbs 3, 5, 6, your word guides me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. I surrender my plans into your hands, trusting that your direction is for my good. Pray for a heart of compassion, inspired by your love. In Ephesians 4.32, your word instructs, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. May my actions reflect the compassion you have shown me, and may forgiveness be the melody of my interactions. Lord, I lift up the concerns of the world, the brokenness that needs healing, the injustice that needs redress, and the despair that needs your hope. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, your promise echoes, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin. 
and will heal there. May our collective prayers be a catalyst for healing and transformation. Pray for wisdom, recognizing its surpassing value. In James 1.5, your word assures me, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Grant me, O Lord, the wisdom to discern your will and the courage to follow where you lead. In a world filled with diverse spiritual teachings and charismatic personalities, it is essential for believers to be vigilant and discerning. Throughout history, false prophets have emerged, seeking to deceive and lead astray those who earnestly seek truth and spiritual guidance. In this video, we shed light on the importance of recognizing and responding to false prophets, equipping believers with the tools necessary to safeguard their faith. The Prevalence of False Prophets False prophets have existed since ancient times and continue to operate today, masquerading as messengers of divine truth. Their charismatic personas, eloquent speeches, and deceptive signs and wonders can captivate the hearts and minds of even the most sincere believers. It is crucial for us to be aware of their presence and the potential harm they can inflict upon unsuspecting individuals and communities. The Biblical Warning Signs the Bible provides clear warnings about false prophets, guiding believers in discerning their true intentions. Jesus himself cautioned his disciples, saying, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7 verse 15 Additionally, the Apostle Paul urged the early church to test the spirits, emphasizing the importance of discernment. 1 John 4 1 Scripture teaches that false prophets often distort the truth, promote their own agendas, and exploit the vulnerability of those seeking spiritual guidance. They may twist Scripture, downplay the deity of Christ, or offer false promises of health, wealth, and prosperity without addressing the necessity of genuine repentance and surrender to God. The Role of Discernment Discernment is an invaluable gift in spiritual discipline that allows believers to distinguish truth from falsehood. Through prayer, the study of God's Word, and dependence on the Holy Spirit, we can develop a keen sense of discernment. This discernment enables us to identify false prophets and teachings that deviate from the biblical truth. Discernment is not a passive endeavor but an active pursuit of wisdom and truth. It requires humility, an open mind, and a willingness to submit to God's Word above all else. By cultivating discernment, we equip ourselves to navigate the spiritual landscape with wisdom, protecting our faith and influencing others to do the same. Accountability within the Christian community Accountability within the Christian community plays a vital role in guarding against false prophets. We are called to support, challenge, and encourage one another in our faith journeys. By engaging in honest and open conversations, sharing our concerns, and seeking counsel from trusted spiritual mentors, we create a network of accountability that safeguards our faith. Furthermore, the responsibility falls upon pastors and church leaders to equip their congregations with sound biblical teaching, addressing the rise of false prophets. By preaching and teaching the full counsel of God's Word, pastors provide a solid foundation upon which believers can build their faith and discern truth from falsehood. Dear brothers and sisters, the threat of false prophets is ever present, seeking to deceive and lead astray those who earnestly seek spiritual truth. However, we need not succumb to fear or despair. By grounding ourselves in God's Word, cultivating discernment, and fostering accountability within the Christian community, we can protect our faith and stand firm against deception. Let us heed the biblical warnings, remaining vigilant in our quest for truth. May we be steadfast in prayer, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit and discerning the voices that vie for our attention. Through the power of God's truth and the support of our Christian community, we can confidently navigate the spiritual landscape, guarding our faith and proclaiming the transformative message of the gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be wary of false prophets in today's world. 
In a world marked by spiritual curiosity and the quest for guidance, it is essential for believers to exercise discernment and caution. False prophets, individuals who claim to speak on behalf of God, but propagate distorted or deceptive teachings have existed throughout history. In this video, we delve into the significance of being vigilant and discerning in identifying false prophets, as well as the potential dangers they pose to our faith. The Warning Signs of False Prophets False prophets often possess charismatic personalities and claim to have divine revelations or insights. However, their teachings may deviate from the fundamental truths found in God's Word. It is crucial for believers to recognize warning signs that help identify false prophets. These signs include 1. Distorted Teachings False prophets may twist or misinterpret Scripture to fit their own agendas, selectively emphasizing certain verses while disregarding others that challenge their teaching. 2. Self-exaltation False prophets often seek personal gain, elevating themselves as the sole bearers of divine authority or claiming unique insights that set them apart from others. 3. Lack of accountability False prophets may shy away from scrutiny, avoiding accountability and surrounding themselves with followers who unquestioningly accept their teaching. 4. Fruitless Results Jesus teaches us that we can identify false prophets by their fruits. Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20. If their teachings do not produce godly character, love, and righteousness, it is a cause for concern. The Dangers of False Prophets the influence of false prophets can have profound consequences on individuals and communities. Their deceptive teachings can lead people away from the truth, causing confusion, doubt, and ultimately, a weakening of their faith. False prophets can exploit the vulnerability of those seeking spiritual guidance, deceiving them with empty promises and leading them astray. Moreover, false prophets can sow division within the body of Christ. By distorting the truth, they create factions and conflicts among believers. This not only hinders unity, but also tarnishes the reputation of the church in the eyes of the world. The Call to Discernment In the face of false prophets, believers are called to exercise discernment and wisdom. We must be grounded in God's Word and intimately acquainted with His character, allowing His truth to serve as the standard by which we evaluate all teachings. The Bereans in the Book of Acts provide a powerful example for us as they diligently studied the scriptures to ensure the accuracy of the apostles' teachings, Acts 17, verse 11. Discernment also comes through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Through prayer and reliance on the Spirit's guidance, we can discern the authenticity of prophetic messages and the teachings of those who claim to speak on behalf of God. Cultivating a Firm Foundation to protect ourselves and others from the influence of false prophets, we must cultivate a firm foundation in our faith. This includes 1. Personal relationship with God By nurturing our relationship with God through prayer, study of His Word, and worship, we develop intimacy with Him, enabling us to recognize His voice amidst the noise of false teachings. 2. Knowledge of Scripture A deep understanding of God's Word is essential in discerning truth. Regular study and meditation on Scripture enable us to discern deviations from biblical teachings. 3. Community and Accountability Engaging in fellowship with other believers allows for mutual encouragement, correction, and accountability. Together, we can sharpen one another's discernment skills and guard against deception. In a world inundated with spiritual voices and teachings, it's paramount for believers to exercise caution and discernment. False prophets pose a significant threat to our faith and the integrity of the church. By remaining rooted in God's Word, cultivating a personal relationship with Him and relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can safeguard ourselves and others from the influence of false prophets. Let us be vigilant, continually examining teachings against the truth of Scripture and seeking God's wisdom. May our discernment be marked by love, humility, and and a desire to honor God above all else. By doing so, we can navigate the complexities of our spiritual journey and stand firm in the truth that sets us free. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
You're about to discover the poverty programming that's kept you stuck like Chuck in a pickup truck. Make sure you watch this entire video. You know what's really interesting? People will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with their programming. Listen carefully. People will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with their programming. In fact, your programming runs on your subconscious mind. So let's pretend for a minute that your mind is a supercomputer. Get it. Let's pretend. Okay, so let's pretend for a minute that your mind is a supercomputer and you've got your subconscious mind and you've got your conscious mind. In a computer, you have to have an operating system. What is an operating system? An operating system is the main software of a computer that tells the computer what other software programs it can and cannot run. The problem with our supercomputer of our mind is most of us. We did not choose our operating system. The cultural hypnotic societal mechanism chose that for us. And the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism, which includes the schools we went to, the churches we've gone to, our parents, our neighbors, our siblings, our friends, our co-workers, our bosses, our employees, the media, the government, all of it has programmed us with what I call a failure operating system. And if you put a failure program in a computer with a failure operating system, it can run that program. But guess what? If you put success software in a computer that's programmed with a failure operating system, all you're going to get is an error message. By the way, that's why so many people, when they hear some truth about wealth, they have to resist it because their subconscious programming won't allow them to run that program. And so success and failure both operate or produced from the subconscious mind or what I like to call the automatic mind. I like to call our subconscious our automatic mind and our conscious mind our manual mind. All of the results, like 90 of the results in your life, are produced by your automatic mind, which means you're not even aware of it. It's running below the surface. It's happening automatically, and you don't even see it. But here's what's interesting. Other people who are not programmed like you can see your programming. How many are picking up what I'm putting down? And see, what happens is when we hear some truth that's unfamiliar to us, the first thing we do is we resist it because, well, that can't be true because that doesn't go along with my programming. Because people will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with the programming. But here's what's interesting. I don't know if you all can remember back in the 80s, late 80s, when you'd have like the 80, 86 computer, you had the floppy drives, and when they came out with a new software system for the computer, they came out with a new operating system. You had to uninstall the old operating system, which usually took a couple of hours. And then you had to keep putting these floppy disks in and taking one out, putting one in, taking one out, putting one in, taking one out, putting one in. And it took a long time to reprogram the operating system, that computer. Does anybody remember those days? Okay, got a couple of us are old enough to remember those days, okay? And so what happened is they'd make new software, but the new software wouldn't run on the old operating system, right? And so you had to pick a day where, okay, I'm going to have to uninstall this operating system, and then I'm going to have to set an alarm to wake up in the middle of the night and keep on putting these disks in so I could use my computer tomorrow. Well, the same way it took a long time back then to uninstall an operating system and reinstall a new one, it takes a long time for most people to uninstall their failure operating system and install a success operating system. That's why you have to stay plugged into information and content that is reprogramming you, because eventually here's what's going to happen. I promise you. You see, how many of you all notice that when you see somebody who's really, really good at something, they're really, really good. They make something so complex look effortless. Like Michael Jordan was so much better than everybody else when he was in the NBA. When he played basketball, he made it look effortless. Tiger Woods made making birdies and eagles look like he was playing with a child's toy. Why? Because they had a totally different operating system going. But see, operating systems don't just affect us in sports. They affect us in every aspect of our lives. They affect us in our finances. They affect us in our businesses. And what happens is we resist because it's uncomfortable to uninstall that old programming. You know why it's uncomfortable? Because Grandmama gave it to me. It's uncomfortable because Mama gave it to me. Because Daddy gave it to me. Because my Uncle Sam gave it to me. And my Aunt Susie gave it to me. And so I don't want to take it out. My favorite teacher gave it to me, and my pastor gave it to me, and the deacon gave it to me. And we have all of this programming that's not serving us and not giving us the ability to serve anybody else. Or guess what? Did you ever notice that people who are failing like miserably, they make that look effortless? No, seriously, I'm not trying to be funny. They're not saying, I'm just going to wake up and mess up my life today. It's just all the moves they do that day just mess up the whole day. Why? It's their programming. And now watch this. This poverty programming. Like you have been programmed to be broker. The cultural, the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism has programmed you to be sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful. And guess what? As long as you are running this program, you're going to be sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful. Either one of those things or all of those things. Why does the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism want us sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful? Because people who are sick, broke, misinformed, and fearful are easier to control than people who are healthy, well-informed, and courageous. 
And so what we have to do is we have to recognize the program. We have to recognize where it comes from. Do you understand? Every time the politicians lie to you and tell you they're going to end income inequality, how do you know they're lying? Because they can't end income inequality. Because income doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's the result of something. What's it the result of? It's a result of value that's created for somebody other than you. So until you eliminate value creation inequality, you can't eliminate income inequality. They are lying. The government wants you to think that businesses that are successful are successful because the owners of those businesses are evil. But reality is the promoter of that message is the one that's evil. Now, there are some businesses that are evil. I'm not saying there are no businesses. There are some businesses that where the owners have evil intention. But that's not generally the nature of business. The media, the movies. I'm not crazy about movies. But the movies that I hate the most, superhero movies, I can't stand them. They're so terrible. They have programmed so many people to be broke. Say, what do you mean? Like, you never even thought about that before, right? See? They started programming you when you were a little kid. Anybody remember this guy named Superman? Right, Superman. You remember who he was, right? He was an adopted poor little orphan from another planet. Who was his arch enemy? Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor. What was he? Multimillionaire. Subconsciously, they don't have C. Do you understand that every time a story is being told, it's being told on two levels? There's the covert story. That's the part that talks to your head. It's only there to distract you. And the overt story, that's the part that talks to your heart. It's there to program you, okay? What about Spider-Man? Oh, another little poor little orphan raised by his aunt and uncle. Who's his arch enemy? Oh yeah, that's right, the Green Goblin. He wasn't a multimillionaire. He was a multibillionaire. They're always associating wealth with evil. And I know what you're thinking. See, I already know what you're thinking. Because I'm a mind reader. You're thinking what Batman was rich. How many of y'all were thinking that? I know you were. But you won't catch me on that one. You're right, Batman was rich. But he's the only superhero with no superpower. Now, which one would you rather do, have a cool car or just fly? Okay, I can't even go there yet. I can't go there yet, but I will. I'll touch on it since you brought it up, okay? Just be ready, okay? I know the other thing you're thinking. Yeah, but Iron Man's rich, don't you? I'm reading your mind. I already told you. But watch this. Iron Man is a narcissistic jerk who takes advantage and walks over everybody and walks on everybody. So if they make a superhero that's rich, they always give them an undesirable character trait. What about the Black Panther? See, here's what the enemy did with the Black Panther. Black people, we felt so disenfranchised that, unfortunately, far too many of us, just because something's black, we want to go with it. But see, here's the problem I had with Black Panther. They were literally in the movie teaching ancestor worship. Ancestor worship. Well, what am I going to worship my dead ancestors for? God's the one that made them. I think I'm going to worship him. Black Panther was cool. He was rich. He was cool. He was smart. He could fight. He did all that. But they had to throw that ancestor worship because the enemy is always trying to trip us up. And he'll use whatever method necessary, whatever method necessary, whatever method possible. See, I'm going to tell you something while I'm on this subject. Our primary identifying factor should not be our color, and it should not be our gender. It should not be our educational level. It should not be the amount of money that we have. It should not be an association that we're a part of. It should not be our fraternity. It should not be our neighborhood. It should not be our country club. Our primary identifying factor of our lives should be the fact that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And if that's not first, you got the wrong thing. In first place, I am not black first, by the way. Martin Luther King dreamed of a day when a man would no longer be judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character, and now we want to be judged. We just want to judge things by the color of the skin. Do you understand? Every time we go along with something that's as a black person, every time we go along with something that's something that's black and whack, we're just doing what the oppressors of our ancestors did. We're agreeing with the oppressors of our ancestors. The most important thing about us is the color of our skin. It's not, I personally like being a brother. You know what I'm saying? I like my brother's swag. You know what I'm saying? I like it. But guess what? If I was white, I would enjoy that just as much because watch this. I made exactly the way God desired me to be. And I'm not in competition with anybody. So I can celebrate you and it don't take anything from me. And I can celebrate me and it don't take anything from you. If you think me celebrating me takes something from you, I'm not the one with the problem. And if I think that you celebrating you as taking something from me, I'm the one with the problem. James, the brother of the Lord. He wrote a book in the New Testament called James. His name was really uh, Yaakov, which is Jacob, but King James. And they changed it to James. And it's not James, but anyway, James, the brother of Jesus. Here's what he said. He didn't say James, the brother of the Lord. He didn't say James, the senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem. He didn't say Reverend James, the senior pastor, the Church of Jerusalem. Here's what he said. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his primary identifying factor. And if it's good enough for the half-brother Lord, who's a senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem, it's good enough for me for it to be my primary identifying factor. 
We have been programmed by the government, by the media. Do you realize that Hollywood started waging war on business in the 1970s? We didn't even see it. By the time the average American turns 18 years of age, they've seen 10,000 people murdered on television and movies by business people and entrepreneurs. They've seen more people murdered on television by entrepreneurs and business people than even career criminals. No wonder people don't want to go into business. All they want to do is save the planet. They've been programmed. Let me say this. You weren't born with any ideas. All of the beliefs you have, somebody, you got them from somewhere. So you might want to check the source before you start running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction and then end up off a cliff somewhere. See, here's what we got to do. We got to understand that the results that my life are producing, my life is producing those results automatically. And so if I want to produce some different results, I have to reprogram my automatic mind. I have to be intentional and I have to be aware. I have to be aware of the fact, like, where is this coming from? I know from Genesis chapter 1, there are four levels of value. The lowest level is implementation. Use your muscles. I'm not going to do it that way. Use your muscles over time. That's the resource you use to make money. This is why you're broke. What do I mean by that? Wealth is a spiritual result. Wealth is spiritual. It is not physical in its nature. It is spiritual in its nature. Because money that you have can be in more than one place at a time. Only spiritual things can be in more than one place at a time. The thing that gives money its value is, there's nothing backing the money. There's nothing backing this money I have in my pocket. The thing that makes it valuable is the message that it carries. $100 bill is more valuable than a penny, even though the material the penny is made out of is worth more than the material the $100 bill is made out of. So if money were material, a penny would be worth more than a $100 bill. But a $100 bill is worth 10,000 times more. Why? Because on a penny, it says one cent, which means 1% of $1 bill. On a $100 bill, it says $100, which means 100 times $1. So the message that it carries is the thing that makes it valuable. But watch this. The other reason it's valuable is because we believe it's valuable. So the two things that make money valuable are the message that it carries and the faith that it creates. Language is spiritual and faith is spiritual. Wealth is a spiritual outcome, but muscles are a physical resource. Time is a limited resource. We are multiplying a physical resource. Times is a limited resource, and we're attempting to produce an unlimited spiritual result. No wonder you're broke. Second level unification. Unification, second level of value. On that level, we use our management skills to make money. We're not broke. You might make anywhere from $40,000 to $250,000 a year. But if a company's paying you $250,000 a year, here's what they want you to know. They want you to know that. They know they own you. They don't care none about your child's recital, your grandfather on his deathbed. Nothing, right? What's the next level? Above that dotted line is where wealth begins to be created. This is communication. This is the second highest level of value. The highest level of value is imagination. Here, your income on the communication level is going to be somewhere between 100000 a year if you sell cars. And it might be $100 million a year if you're a high-level actor or a top singer, or maybe you write songs. Or maybe you write movies. $100 million a year. These are communication imagination. These are people who come up with the best idea. The resource you use here is your mouth. You got to have a mouth and you got to learn how to use it. Pretty much everybody here qualifies for the first part. Now you got to start working on the second part. And then your mind. The resource you use up here for imagination are your mind and your money to make money. When you do that, it will take your life to a whole nother level. But you've been programmed. You've been programmed to stay down here or to work real hard and get a degree so you can move up here. And this you don't even value? Do you realize? And I'm going to end with this. In business school, they don't even teach you how to sell. You go to school for six or eight years to learn how to be a lawyer. They teach you how to practice all this law. They don't teach you how to get any clients to practice law for. You go to school for eight to 20 years to learn how to be a doctor, and they teach you how to work on the human body. They don't teach you how to get any human bodies to work on. We've been programmed to be broke, and poverty program is costing you a fortune. That's why I always say, if you're broke, if you make less than $50,000 a month, you can't afford to be watching television. You need to be using that time to read some books to learn a new skill. But don't you want to see them play basketball? Don't you want to see them in movies? I don't want to see them. I want to be them. I want somebody watching my life on TV. Okay, so that's how people are programmed to be broke for the rest of your life? Don't let the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism program you to be broke because your family deserves better than that. God bless you. Like, subscribe. Peace out. Cub Scouts. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.